we're going to talk about the um, a little bit focus on usability first, and then um, mostly Kevin's going to talk about performance tuning. And so again, the the uh, the, the architecture uh, of. Open vSwitch, we won't go into this again, but this Open vSwitch, of course, is, uh, is designed for multiple data planes, and the idea, again, is that DPDK can, uh, can replace the Linux kernel data plane, and hopefully it'll operate pretty much the same way that the Linux kernel does. And again, the evolution and the architectural evolution of OVS um, facilitates multiple data planes, and we pretty much know what all about the architecture, but inevitably there's going to be some differences between the way DPDK performs and the way, OV, uh, the, way the Linux kernel data plane performs in issues other than performance. So the main thing I wanted, I wanted to get at was that the, um, with Open vSwitch with DPDK is, of course, we're as is the example with OPNFE and whatnot, is we want it to be a good citizen and fit into an environment with OpenStack in a transparent way. And that's what, that's what we'd like to achieve. And so that we can see DPDK have a performance gain without, without too much cost in terms of usability. So I wanted just to uh, uh, tell a little bit about how I started working with DPDK. So back so some years ago at, at the Open Networking Summit, I saw a presentation from Intel. And at that time, it was just amazingly intriguing, you know, because everybody was spending um, much money uh, among the customer world, which I was part of, in uh, a lot of money for front-end uh, front custom, custom switchings on their box. I was in a in a, a world working on security, and we wanted to get packets in fast for doing analysis to feed uh, uh, pipelines for um, doing big data analysis and defect and uh, um, intrusion detection. So we had a requirement to, to go up to 10 gig interfaces without adding the cost for a custom hardware switch because in a, in a competitive environment for the sort of IDS, IPS that we were building. So was DPDK the answer? We had to prove that. But back in those days, uh, late, uh, about a year and a half ago, we had DPDK 171 and OVS 2.3 and starting out with nothing as a user and just working with, uh, with uh, upstream projects. It was, they weren't really integrated. There were a couple of different things. There was a, um, a, for, a sort of a fork by um, uh, Frank, I think, is here, uh, which integrated a, a DPI directly with low-level calls into OVS. There was, of course, dpdk.org, and uh, um, with, uh, with DPDK forks and with basically talking about OVS, and then there was another project from Intel with a pre previously pre-integrated. So they didn't all, it was just trying to find a solution that would compile that we could build our application on top of, and it was quite difficult. So it, in 1.8, it all came together, and, and then thing, I think the world really started to change. So in 1.8, in the master branch, at least of OVS, was, was integrated with DPDK 1.8, and I was able to, at that point, fairly quickly, get DPDK up and running, and even with a pure virtual solution, so I'm using the VMX Net3 driver, which was um, worked as a PMD driver. Um, it, I was able to show uh, per, enough performance gain to be able to move the decision path uh, forward, and also was able to use DPDK rings to integrate with with the DPI engine. And now, of course, we've moved forward quite a bit with much much improvement. So the question, one question that comes up in DPDK is, is it really still experimental? Is it time for this patch uh, to remove 
where it says experimental. Which button presses the laser on here? Oh, the middle, okay, that thing. There we are, it's kind of, well, anyway, you can see it. So, uh, and, then, and then there's been, uh, there was one thread back, I, I guess about a month ago with um, addressing this issue when someone said, is it still experimental about improvements to DPDK? And at this point, quite a few of them have been done. And one of the things, for example, is uh, device handling for DPDK to make it transparent. Uh, we need a better debuggability uh, but using a PMD driver to feed libpcap. And of course, it's, it, the difficulty there, of course, is keeping up with 10 gig pull mode drivers for debugging. You might have to drop packets, but it'd be nice to at least have the familiar interface so people could, could use tools like TCP dump, et cetera. And of course, the, another thing that, that we're working on is uh, a continuous, edu um, continuous in integration frame for, for uh, DPDK testing and patch testing, uh, working with our, our, and displaying the results through patchwork. Uh, another um, issue is the, uh, we, that we've had in the past is we still carry along vhost queues, queues instead of just focusing on vhost user. And there's a better documentation, I think it was Kevin, um, that, that uh, recently introduced a patch which was merged to improve the documentation about installing DPDK and so on. So um, basically, that, that, with that, I want to uh, pass the baton over to Kevin. I'm just a warm up here, so now the real act comes. <laughs> Okay, uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, where are we? Okay, so I guess the, the last presentation, um, Gerald talked about performance figures, and MJ gave a very performant uh, presentation as well. So, um, but one thing that comes up in terms of performance is, well, you know, with regard to usability, is what do I need to do to actually get that usability? So if we take a, an example maybe of um, traffic coming in on a, on a physical NIC, uh, going into OVS, into the OVS with DPDK data path. So the, the Polmo driver will receive the packets, it will do a lookup, figure out where they need to go, and it will transmit them. Uh, up into a VM, and maybe some processing there, and then back down to uh, like a vhost user port, and then you know, similarly uh, receive, do the lookup, and transmit. So a common thing that happens is people just run it completely out of the box, and there's a lot of contention for, say, probably something like a core zero. So in this case, you know, you could have some operating system tasks running there, you could have some of your you know, vCPUs from your, uh, from your guest, and then all the switching, you know, trying to pull those four ports, get the packets off them, and send them on their way, is gonna be done too. So what tends to happen then is, you know, the, you can't keep up with the, with the packets coming in on the physical NIC, and you end up just, you know, overflowing your queues and dropping packets. So what can we do? So the simplest thing is to, um, so we can isolate CPUs, obviously, so we, you know, we give the core zero to the operating system, we'll take the rest to, to use. We can pin the VM, that's fine. So when it comes to um, open vSwitch then, so we wanna try and make sure that the, the core that's doing the forwarding, so the pole mode thread gets a core really to itself and it's not being interrupted. And you know we can set that so there's a minus C option when we run uh, when we run OVS with DPDK, and that's where the kind of control threads for OVS will go. But there's a, a command which is listed below that will actually set where uh, where and how many um, uh, pole mode threads will run. Okay, so in this case we've run it on core one, and that is CPU mass two. So that's not an error. That's a hex mask. Um, and you know that, that can actually be a lot of the, the issue is, is really things interrupting that core that's doing the, that's trying to do the packet forwarding. Um, you know, also we see that in certain use cases, um, you know, more aggressive compiler optimizations like using minus 03 or, or OFAST can make things faster. Um, so what if we gave it another core, would that help with things? So if we think about this was a bi-directional maybe and there's traffic flowing, there's a lot of traffic flow on all the ports. We've got four ports. Um, 
So two physical NIC, say, and two VHOST user, they're all producing traffic into the switch. So yeah, absolutely, like a second core would help. So we just split the workload and we have two cores to service the four ports. Could we keep going, put a port, you know, a core uh, associated with each port? Absolutely, and we should see an improvement in performance. Um, another thing, so I've picked core 1 and 11, 2 and 12 deliberately. So that's kind of a hint at hyper-threading. Um, so if there was hyper-threading on in, a, say, a 10-core system, they'd be uh, thread siblings. So I guess with, hyper, with, a, with a, an application like OBS where we scale very well with multiple cores, um, hyper-threading really makes a big difference. So I think you know, that maybe would give it a 25% boost. Now, obviously, hyper-threading is system-wide, so there would maybe be other considerations, but certainly for, the, you know, for open vSwitch, it would, with DPDK, it would help. Uh, but you know, we might not want to give four cores for switching. That's the other thing. We might want to use them for our VM or something like that. So that's up to, up to, up to you. So OK, so if we had a fifth core, what could we do with it? Um, with no more ports left to pull. So the next thing we can do is multi-queue. So, um, so with multi-queue, instead of having you know, a core associated with a port, we can put multiple queues on the port and then have multiple cores associated with each one of those queues. So on the physical side, that's there already. The diagram probably doesn't show too well because it's split before, it looks like before it goes into the NIC. But, um, so that's done through receive side scaling. Um, on the virtual side, so there's been good work. I'm looking for Flavio. By Flavio on the OVS side, also worked on the DPDK community and the QMU community to get vhost user multi-queue. So I think the status of that is that the code is upstreamed in DPDK and QMU. And hopefully when we integrate the latest versions of them, you know, maybe in a month or two, um, Flavio has pushed patches. And hopefully we can, in the next few months, we can get it all into OVS. OK. OK, so just in terms of usability, just to say that install at DPDK is probably still the kind of, I would say, the best resource for um, installing and getting going with OVS with DPDK. Uh, you know, perhaps I think maybe next few months we'll try and do some blogs on maybe different features and try and get some more information out there. Uh, I've, I have a feeling that maybe it's a little sparse maybe for somebody just new to it, so maybe a bit of a wider explanation would be helpful. In performance tuning, there's a section in the install.dpdk that covers that. Um, and earlier, Gerald talked about the, the ONP um, server release, and the, there's benchmarking done on that, and there's also a section to show the, ben the, the performance tuning that was done um, you know, to get those results. OK, so just in terms of ease of actual availability of OVS with DPDK. So I mean, Tom has given me a big list of uh, different kind of Red Hat associated uh, places where there's OVS and DPDK. And it's, it's, you know, there's a lot of different ones. And I think it's, it's going to grow as well. Um, Ubuntu have packaged it in their latest release. We heard earlier on about uh, OPNFE and their plans for having, you know, integrating OVS with DPDK. Um, and then the actual, apart from the benchmarks in, the, in, o, in Intel OMP server, there's a, there's a kind of a reference platform, and it's OVS with DPDK is there. And then, of course, the, the source code is obviously available. But I suppose the interesting thing is if we'd put that slide up a year ago, we'd probably just have the two Git clones. So good progress there, I think. OK, so just to wrap this up, I suppose the first thing that comes to mind when people talk about OVS with DPDK is performance. And probably rightly so, like we saw the, the graphs that Gerald had presented earlier. But I think we need to realize that there's also a big list of features. It's not just performance. It's trying to add those features to, you know, to make it more usable. Um, but there's also things that are needed, softer things like debuggability, um, you know, just making it work out of the box without a lot of complicated setup. Um, so different use cases. So that's fine. Okay, well we can do, you know, fight to fight. But what happens if there's tunneling involved or, or that and statistics as well? So. I think you know, you'll see a lot of focus, I hope, over the next, over the next year of, you know, there'll be still focus on performance, as Gerald has said, but also you know, to try on focus on usability to make sure we find the right balance between performance and usability. 
Okay. Um, so the only last thing I had was I had set up a, an OBS with DPDK meetup. I think nearly all the seats are gone. It's, it's over in the, it's on tomorrow over in one of the other rooms. Um, just maybe, there's maybe a handful of places left if anybody's interested. Probably going to be talking about, you know, more, in a lot more detail, probably some of the low level, like some of the things Tom talked about, debuggability and, you know, how the, the net dev with DPDK interfaces. That's the slide that Gerald talked about, and uh, that's it. All right, let's thank our speakers. So before we get into the, the real questions, I have one that's almost trivia. I, I noticed that you were, uh, you were setting these masks that would naturally be expressed in, say, hexadecimal or octal in decimal. Do we not support uh, hexadecimal for those? No, that, that is hex, it just doesn't have uh, oh, okay. It, it's hex, but it doesn't have the 0x prefix on yeah. it. Okay, now I understand. That makes sense. Yeah. Now let's get some real questions. Uh, uh, step up to a mic if you have a question for, uh, for Thomas or Kevin. No questions? Tiring after lunch. Uh, any uh, any uh, uh, final comments or, or, or th I don't know, questions for the community or future directions that uh, you want to talk about? Yeah, uh, so I mean, absolutely. And I think you know, one thing is we'd like to see as many people as possible engaging because you know, definitely there's criticisms and you know, we're open to them and open to try and improve them. And you know, wherever we can, I mean, you know, what, we, what we'd like to do is make OVS with DPDK as easy to run as OVS without DPDK. And there's still a bit of a gap, but I think we're working on it, and you know, if I, anybody can help. I, I have a question. Is it time to readdress the experimental label for DPDK? What, what does the, and we could talk about this tomorrow as well, but what, what are the remaining things that DPDK needs to accomplish? And I, I, I can guess the D word's gonna come up. It's more visible uh, DPDK data plane not just performance testing, but operational testing, but what else? That's a great question. I think it really comes down to what, what's the definition of experimental. My guess is that there are a lot of people uh, starting to use a DPDK-based OVS in production. And at that point, maybe by definition, it's no longer experimental. Uh, so, uh, Actually, sorry, sorry, one final comment to M. You know, in terms of the actual DPDK community, so there was a DPDK user space event um, about maybe two months ago. So I think they're very open to the feedback from the OVS community. So we gave them a, you know, a presentation, and so, some of it was similar to this, where we, where we really showed them, look, you know, can you help us fix some of these things and make things better? And I think they're very open to that. So I, you know, I think it'll be a, a cross kind of project um, initiative to, you know, to, to, to get things in, in a better shape. And improve yes. Things. If I can add, tomorrow's event is kind of a follow-up to discussions that started at DPDK User Space in, in Dublin uh, last month. So I just have uh, one, one final comment there. Uh, um, when you flashed up the slide that listed all of the, uh, the, the places where uh, uh, OVS is packaged, uh, it, it made me feel a little guilty because I am the, uh, I am the upstream maintainer of, uh, um, of the Debian packaging. I, I am the Debian maintainer, uh, uh, along with, I believe, Simon Horman as a, a, a co-maintainer. Uh, but I've been doing a really bad job of uploading uh, uh, newer versions. So if there are any Debian maintainers uh, in the room or outside the room, um, I'd, I'd really appreciate it if, if someone else wanted to, uh, uh, to, to start uh, helping out with that or, or even to uh, possibly take it over. So if you're interested in that, please, please contact me. All right, uh, let's uh, thank our speakers one more time.